It's a relentless pursuit, relentless pursuit. I will not stop chasing after you. It's a relentless pursuit, a passionate pursuit. I will not stop chasing after you. It's a relentless. Relentless pursuit I will not stop chasing after you It's a relentless pursuit A passionate pursuit I will not stop chasing after you It's a relentless pursuit and young adults, y'all are dismissed. How's everybody doing tonight? Amen. We're getting our our hearts prepared, aren't we? We're in a preparation time, and I just have just a a few announcements for you here before we get started. Um, As as you all know, this Sunday is a Resurrection Sunday. We are so excited. uh, We're going to celebrate the whole reason why we're Christians is that he resurrected and we resurrected with him. That's right. So we hope you're going to come on Sunday morning and bring your family, bring some friends and just pack it in. Yes, we are packing it in on Sunday. And so we want to make sure that when you do come, get here early and get in the middle first. Okay? There will be a lot of extra chairs in this place, and we know God He's, God's got it, and uh, we've got lots of kids coming. It's going to be wonderful because right after service, we're having a party in the parking lot. We're going to have free food, Jersey Mike subs. We're going to have bounce houses for the kids. We've got egg hunts for all ages and prizes for them. So we're just going to have just a, a wonderful time together. So I know that you all have friends out there. you got people that need Jesus, and they want to come to a place where they can encounter God. And so that's where you need to invite them to come. If it, and, be, and those of you who are members in this place, we're just asking you if it gets too busy, and we believe that it will, if you stand up and give your seat to somebody, that would really, truly be a blessing. All of us who are members, we need to make sure that we do everything we can to make those that are new in this place feel comfortable so that they can, they can feel the love just like all, all of us have over the years here at Freedom Destiny. I also want to announce that next Saturday, April 11th, uh, Destiny Women are going over to the Abundant Peace Ministries from 11 to 2. Um, Pastor Annie Montgomery um, is, is having an event called the Master's Marvelous Makeover. I'm going to be speaking at that event. And women, if you'd like to go, there's flyers out front. It's $15 for your lunch. There's a lunch that's served. And so you just need to sign up through their website at AbundantPeaceMinistries.org. So I hope you all ladies can can come on out and meet some other new ladies from other churches. And we're going to have a good time. And there's going to be other speakers there at this event. There's going to be a lot that we're going to learn that day. So please think about coming and inviting a friend to that. Then, of course, this Sunday as well is the day that we're preparing ourselves to bring an offering to the Lord. 
We do this every year. It's a Passover offering that we bring to God. This year is, is special in that it is our Exodus offering. And so if you have not filled out a commitment card already, what you would like to pledge for the next three years as we begin to make our journey across the Jordan that way, then we invite you to grab a connection card out front. You can bring that also in on Sunday morning with whatever God leads you to give that day because that day is very, very special because directly following that, we will be preparing ourselves to go to the bank so that we can take possession of our property. And so we ask that you really seek the Lord about that day and exactly what you want to especially bring that particular day. And if you've pledged for three years and you bring whatever you bring that day and it's more than you would normally do on a monthly basis in your pledge, that's okay because we will reduce your pledge amount. But we want you to just carefully think about this Sunday as our day to cross over the Jordan River and begin to move into the promises that God has for us. And I'm going to speak about that today. I'm going to speak about stepping into the Jordan River. But I'd, I'd like to introduce to you real quick our brand new nursery and preschool coordinator, which is Garrison Knight. Garrison, come on up. Our ministry has been expanding so much. And um, we have room captains who watch over our nursery and our preschool. And so we've come to a place where we need to really expand and bring in some leadership for our nursery and preschool area. And so through interview processes and all, Garrison was the one that God has chosen for this particular position. So I just want to give him a chance to just share with you all a little bit. Hi, everybody. Like she said, I'm Garrison. You probably see me over there playing with all your children and probably playing even more than they are. But um, I'm just excited and looking forward to seeing what God's going to do through all your children and just bring life to them. And, yep. and anyone who's willing to serve in preschool or nursery, we're always looking forward to having new people. We encourage you because we're always, they're bouncing around everywhere. So oh, we need lots of eyes so that they don't get hurt or anything. And as always, we want to do a plug overall for Destiny Kids. For those of you who do have children, you have the opportunity to serve during the year. Maybe consider serving once every eight weeks, once every 12 weeks, whatever it is. Your children are getting fed on a weekly basis here at Freedom Destiny. It would be awesome for you to spend one Sunday in there or one Wednesday night and really learn what they're learning. Be able to see the environment and be able to connect with our leaders Stephen and Tabitha Price, as well as Garrison. All right, let's give the Lord a hand because he's growing our church. He's expanding our church. More people in leadership, more people leading. All right, tonight's message is called Step In. And as you all know, uh, this week we are in our Passover fasting and praying time. We are in a consecration time because God is setting us up to move into our promised land. This April 3rd, which is Friday night, which is Good Friday, at sundown starts Passover according to the Jewish calendar. We will be in this building right about that time, sundown, right when we're stepping into the period of Passover. And so it's going to be an amazing opportunity for all of us as a church body to really connect with God's presence in this place, connect with his Holy Spirit, connect with the fact that because of what Christ did for us on that night more than 2,000 years ago, we have the opportunity now to have the comforter come and live on the inside of us and to lead us and to guide us. So we want to be able to come and, and give God all the honor on Friday, April 3rd. And then Saturday, April 4th at around 7 a.m., when you look into the sky, you will see some blood, a blood moon that will be in existence. This is the third of four blood moons. Blood moons are in accordance with Joel chapter 2. They are definitely the signs of the end times. Last year in 2014, the very first blood moon was on Passover. 
The second one was in the fall time frame around October 8th during the Feast of Tabernacles. The third one is Saturday night. And the fourth one in a series of four, which is highly unusual, takes place this September 28th, 2015 in the Feast of Tabernacles. It is truly amazing that we are living in a time where we have the opportunity to see four moons exactly as God designated on Passover and uh, Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles, the, the times that, that he has chosen to show us these rare occurrences. They've happened in the past before, but very rare. One happened in 1949 and 1950, and after that time, Israel became a state. And in 1967 and 1968, Israel uh, liberated Jerusalem during that time. Also happened back in the 1400s, too, around Columbus's time. But we're living in the day where we get the opportunity to see this tetrad of blood moons. So when you get up Saturday morning after you've been fasting and praying, go on out on, on your in your backyard or your front yard and take a look up at the sky and just let God minister to you for a few minutes because um, truly we have an opportunity to live in a lifetime where, where many will never see this and this consecutively. So God is saying times are coming to an end and Christ is getting ready to return. Praise the Lord. April 5th then is Resurrection Sunday. And so um, this is so exciting because we have the Feast of, of Passover on Friday night, the Feast of Unleavened Bread with the Blood Moons, and then we also have uh, Resurrection Sunday, which is called the Feast of First Fruits. And why is it the Feast of First, first Fruit, actually? It's the Feast of First Fruit because Christ was the first fruit, and he rose that day. Now, I know I don't want to confuse you. I know we have First Fruit. We have a celebration in January, but why do we do that? It's the Gregorian calendar, right? That's why, and that's explained many, many times during, during our practice of First Fruits at the beginning of the year. It's our opportunity to consecrate ourselves and pray for three weeks and come before the Lord with an offering to set our year right and, and put God first. But this is the time on the calendar of God's calendar where Resurrection Sunday is celebrating him who rose as the very first and we who come after him. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 7 through 8 talks about Christ dying on the cross for us, which would be on Good Friday. And the word says, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival. That's right. That's the feast of Passover. Not with old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the bread without yeast, which is the bread of sincerity and truth. So we want to make sure that during this time we are, we are cleansing our hearts. We are asking God to show us where there is wickedness, where there is malice, where there is bitterness, anger, resentment, things of this sort, where we have unforgiveness. Because we want to cleanse our own temples because you are indeed the sanctuary of where the Holy Spirit resides. You want to clean your temple during this time and come out with having the attitude of being righteous. You want to be able to step into that place of sincerity and truth. And what Christ, our Passover lamb, has done for us is that through his shed blood, we have forgiveness for all of our sins, forgiveness, so that we can now step into sincerity and truth. Without him having died on the cross for us, we don't even have the ability to be able to live a righteous life. Because when Christ died on the cross for you, you died with him the same time. It's a spiritual death. You were buried with him on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and you raised with him on the Feast of First Fruits or on Resurrection Sunday. You raised with him. And when you raise with him, you raise with a new life. And that new life is why we celebrate this whole season. We celebrate this season of the fact that it's a new life for you, not only on the inside, but it's a new season for what you're about ready to step into in accordance with the Jewish calendar. Now, in effect, when the whole process happened that you died with Christ, you were buried with him, and you were resurrected in him, well, what died? It was your spirit, man. When we talk about death. You, you had an unregenerate spirit. You had a dead spirit. The dead spirit died. And what became new was your spirit, okay? So when we talk about the newness of life, we're talking about the newness in the spirit. What is not new is your soul. It's the same old thing that you have from the time that your mama gave birth to you. And it is 
filled with wickedness and malice and a whole lot of mess. But because of the Spirit of God on the inside of you, you and the Holy, Spri- Holy Spirit's presence being deposited in your spirit, you now can have power over those very things that have held you in bondage. And so this is why we celebrate what Christ has done for us. You exchanged lives with him, or he exchanged lives with you, and now you have the right to live his life here on earth. His Holy Spirit presence lives in you, and as it comes forth, you're, and you surrender to that, you're actually allowing God's Spirit to rule and reign and allowing God to live his life right here on earth. And so this is a blessing that we have been given. The Word tells us in Exodus chapter 23 that it is a festival that we are to participate in every single year. And that no matter what, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, that, that this is a time where we are to come before the Lord. Let's read that. Exodus chapter 23, verses 15 through 17. The word says, Celebrate the feast of unleavened bread for seven days, and eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Abib, which is right around this time frame, March, April. For in that month you came out of Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Then he gives instructions to celebrate the feast of the harvest, with the first fruits of the crops you sow, you sow in the field, and also to celebrate the Feast of Ingathering at the end of the year. Okay, three times a year, all men are to appear before the Lord. So, because we are saved, because we are redeemed, because we are resurrected, we follow this because we are in the New Testament, and Jesus himself in the New Testament celebrated the feasts. Okay, And many of the disciples celebrated the feast. And so we who are disciples of Christ celebrate the feast today, not as a law, but because we have been saved and we have been redeemed and we simply want to bring the best to the Lord. And bringing the best to the Lord means positioning your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions to bring the best to him. He says that there are seven blessings in Exodus chapter 23 that are yours for this season. I'm going to read to you those seven blessings. Okay, I've also posted those um, on Facebook as well for those of you who may not have um, had the opportunity to hear last Wednesday's message. You can read this in Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 31. I'll just read this to you quickly. And then while I'm reading, just take a look up at the screens because they actually list the blessings. So Exodus 23, verse 20, the word says, See, I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. God has prepared a place for us to go. We believe it's over there. And so with that, he said he's going to send an angel with us. This angel actually has God's name in him. He is a messenger of the Lord, but carrying his name means he is not to be rebuked. He is not to be turned away from. The word says, pay attention to this angel and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. And then verse 22, that's that's blessing number one. And then verse 22 says, if you listen carefully to what he says and do and all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and oppose those who oppose you. In other words, we are to be obedient and do as the Lord says, listen carefully, okay? And then... The word says in verse 23, my angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. In other words, when you go into the promised land, you don't mess with what's there. You're going in to change what's there. You're not going in to agree with what's there. Worship the Lord your God, and his blessing will be on your food and water. He will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land, and he will give you a full lifespan. This is blessing three, four, and five. Then he says, I'm going to send a terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive out the ITs out of your way. But I will not drive them out in a single year, he says. In other words, he's not going to rush them right out of there because if he does, the land would become too desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. 
Little by little, he will drive out before, before us until we've increased enough to take possession of the land. That's a blessing number six and blessing number seven, that God's going to cause increase uh, to come to us. And, um, and he's also going to give us a, spe- a special year's blessing because he says he's going to establish our borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert to the river. And he's going to hand over to us the people who live in the land and that we will drive them out says, don't make a covenant with them or their gods and do not let them live in your land or they'll cause you to sin against me because the worship of their gods will certainly be a snare to you. So we have these seven blessings that God promised the Israelites before going into the promised land. Those same promises are for us today. Not only us as a church, Freedom Destiny, but for you individually. And see, what you need to understand is that there's things that God wants to do in your life. You have promises in your own sphere of influence, and he wants to set you up for those promises. And in doing so, he, when he wants to enlarge your borders and do all these kinds of things, when he's talking about borders being enlarged and the influence that, that's around you being enlarged, he's first saying, I need to enlarge your soul before I can enlarge the territory that you're walking into. You see, because if you go and you just walk into territory and you got the, the same soul that you had last year, you're not, you don't have the capacity to be able to handle what God has before you. You see, we have to think about capacity. God has to think about, look, if I'm taking you in there, then I have to build up your capacity to be able to handle what's there. And, and so I'm not going to drive everything out in one year because you got to grow during that time. And you got your soul's got to stretch. you got to know what's right and wrong. you got to get your act together. I'm not going to get rid of it just like that. It's not going to be instant deliverance just like that. Because if it is and you get all super cleaned up in that one instance, there's going to be another force that's going to come and take over the very one that I got rid of. So what am I going to do? I'm going to cause you to seek after me and to study hard, to pray hard, to fast hard, to do the disciplines hard, to come to church, to worship the Lord in a corporate place, to worship the Lord privately in your closet. I'm going to cause you to be prepared to go into the place that I have for you. And as we prepare ourselves, our capacity increases for what it is that God has for us. People are always complaining why they didn't get themselves an instant instant deliverance. I'll tell you, instant deliverance would scare me. I've seen them happen. But I've also seen somebody walk in a week later, and they completely forgot what just happened to them. You know, I, I, I never want to see anybody in pain one way or the other. That, that's not a good thing for me. I, I have such a compassionate heart. I don't want to see pain. But what I want to see from people is that they grow where they're at so that they have capacity for the destiny that God has for them. And if it means they got to struggle a little bit, just like a butterfly has to struggle out of a cocoon. And if you cut the cocoon too soon, the butterfly can't fly. Because the capacity of a butterfly is to soar all over the place, right? they got to struggle themselves out of that thing. No one wants to see somebody struggle even to get to the next place that God has called them to be. But the fact of the matter is, we ain't the dad. He's the dad. He determines what needs to take place in our lives. But, but when we talk about struggle, we have to struggle from the right foundation. You struggle from the foundation that you have new, new life. You've been given the power. You've been given all you need to get yourself through that struggle. Right? That God is good, and no matter what, if you're in this place, whatever it is, that, that he's enlarging your capacity to take a greater border. We, we suffer from the fact that we live the exchanged life, and in that we have all things. We have increase. You don't struggle from this place. You don't struggle from being a worm. You are not a worm. God did not make you that way. You struggle from a place of victory already. It's about being victorious in Christ all the time. Many times we'll start out here because we don't know how to apply victory. We don't know how to overcome. We don't know how to get where we need to be. But as God grows us up, we get on this side of it. And then we're like, okay, if it's going to happen, if it's got to be this way, all right, I'm still going to praise him anyways. I'm still going to love him anyways. And, and then we know that our souls are coming into the promised land even before we have actually possessed the promised land. Okay, now, when we talk about going into the promised land and we talk about um, how they went and they crossed over the Jordan, I want to take you 
um, into that, that whole event that took place. You see, Exodus chapter 23 is a setup that God has in his word as he's speaking to a whole um, general concept of these seven blessings are yours and they're yours all the time is what he's saying. He's saying it doesn't matter what year it is. It doesn't matter if it started um, yesterday. It's going to go on till tomorrow. Okay. So you have to look at this at although we're, we're, we put the emphasis that this is this time of year, when you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, these seven blessings should be living in your life on a continual basis. Okay, so as God said, look, Israelites, I'm going to send an angel before you, and I'm going to carry you into this promised land. They had quite the journey once, once they got over. I mean, they had to cross the Jordan, and they had an awful lot of wars. They had to drive out nations. I mean, this was not an easy thing. Even though God had made this promise, they weren't just, like, walking right over, you know, and just eating them pomegranates and, like, laying out by the oasis under a palm tree, you know. They, they came over, and they had to fight once they were there, which is why to God it was so important that the capacity of who they were had grown to such a place that they would be able to enter war once they got over there. So when we, when we go into what happened during the time that they had come through the desert and now was the day that they were getting ready to go, we see that in Joshua. So let's go to Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to read these scriptures to you, and then I'm going to break them down just a little bit. So here we are. God makes a general statement in Exodus 23 about this is the blessings of the promised land. And I'm going to send this angel and you're going to go over and there's going to be these seven things. I'm going to take away sickness and all of this. And all of that is truth. But now is D-Day. And your man is Joshua. And the word says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, that after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, he says, Moses, my servant is dead. This is what God says to, to Joshua. Now then, you, Joshua, and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where your foot has tread, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, the Hittite country, Mediterranean Sea in the west, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. He says, be strong and courageous. So this is what he's telling Joshua right before Joshua is getting ready to leave. And then he says, listen, in verse 7, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. In other words, the Lord's saying, listen, the key to being successful over there was the same key that you learned when you were waiting on the manna. When you were humbled and I tested you, it's the same thing. And what did I teach you during that time? We know from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 3 through 5, what was taught to them? That man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. That's what was taught to them. And now God is giving Joshua a reminder. Look, here's the reminder. Do not stray from the law, but keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. First thing that they had learned after all those years, and now again he's reminding the commander-in-chief, look, don't stray. If you don't stray, the people won't stray. You don't stray, hang tight because we're moving over. You're going to be prosperous and successful. If you wait on the word of God, if you obey the word of God, if you listen to every word that comes from my mouth, have I not commanded you, he says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people. Now, this is where we are today. He said, now look, look at your neighbor and say, this is where we are today. Okay, this is like a real thing. Okay, right here, right now. He says, Joshua ordered the officers, officers of the people, those who are in leadership, go through the camp, and I want you to tell the people this. 
get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own, for your own. He, okay, so listen, it's a Wednesday night. And three days from now, you will cross to Jordan, okay? So I'm going to tell you a little secret. Okay, this is a little Pastor Candace secret. Nobody knows this, but it won't be a secret in just about a minute. Everyone will know. On Sunday when I took communion, right here, I took my last communion before crossing over the Jordan. I took my last communion before crossing over the Jordan. The last communion right here in this place because on April 5th, we crossed the Jordan. You see, when you come in here, you get yourself all ready. You prepare yourself. Get on whatever clothes you're taking on your journey. That's going with you. Whatever, whatever you got when you come here, it's going with you. See, we're getting ready. We're crossing. That's our crossing day. See, that's why you get a free sub from Jersey Mike's because you crossed over. I know you were wondering, but, you know, in the promised land, there's Philly cheesesteak. I'm just saying. And for, for Robert Harris and I, there's Krispy Kreme donuts. That's right. Mm-hmm. And the kind that you don't, you don't gain any weight off of eating. That's the kind. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's no multiplication of everywhere else when you eat one of those things. That's the kind of victory I'm looking for. Just kidding, just kidding. Okay, so what happens here? God says, look, you're going to cross the Jordan. You know what the word Jordan means? It means to descend or go downwards. In other words, to bring down or subdue. When they had to go into the Jordan River, they had to humble themselves in order to believe by faith that they were going to cross into the promised land. See, God set it up that it would be at the Jordan River. Early in the morning, this is Joshua chapter 3, verse 1, all the Israelites set out from, from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. They got themselves all ready. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. Not only did they say, bring everything with you, you're getting ready here. But when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. Now now listen. They said, you know what? Here's the bank. But when you get to the bank, you got to humble yourself and then you got to look up and see. You got to see the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the power and the presence of God. See, God says, I'm going to show you where you're going, but you got to look up and see. See, every time you go to enter into the promised land of your own life or of us all together, however you want to put this together, you got to look up and see. you got to see. Why? Because the sight causes everything in your soul to change. When, when you have the visual... And you put this with the rest of the five senses. Then you have taken possession in your soul of what God intends to give you. And then you can apply faith to that reality and begin to step out. So God says, when you see the ark, then you'll know which way to go. Mm. Somebody slap their neighbor and say, God, show me which way to go. You, You see... We need to be positioned for always looking for what God is doing. Jesus himself said, I do nothing except for that which the Father shows me he's doing. I join the Father where he's at, right? Right? The Father tells me, I hear it, and I see it. Then I operate on it. That's just like hearing the word of God and doing what the word of God says. That's just like man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that cometh out of the mouth of God himself, right? This is what causes us to be mature is when we advance to the state of we can hear it and we can see God operating and we just believe it by faith and we step out and we do it. And, and you see, you got to step in because the word says here, 
We're going to go down where they had to step in. But, but after God gives them the instruction to see it, very important to see it, then Joshua tells the people, now look, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Oh, people, look at your neighbor and say, I'm consecrating myself. You know, you are, because what are we doing right now? We're praying and we're fasting. We're getting ourselves ready to go on the journey, are we not? We are. We're doing everything that the Word of God has said in three days, right? We're getting ourselves ready. So the Word, so the word says in verse 6, Joshua tells the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. In other words, the power and the presence of God is over here with what you see. You just got to believe and step into where you see God working. I see God working here. I'm going to get off the bench and I'm going to get into the action. So the ark goes in front of them. And then the Lord says to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know that I'm with you as I was with Moses. That was a little sidebar encouragement to Joshua there because he had himself a big task. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you all the ITs in the land. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. You see, the angel goes ahead of them. The ark goes ahead of them. So what do you people do in the seat? You look ahead of you to where God is working, and you get on it and start working with him. But you got to trust that what you see is the thing that he's showing you you need to reach for. That's where you got the problem. That's where the doubt and unbelief come in. Lord, did I really see that? Lord, I'm really just not sure. Is that really what you're showing my heart? Is that really what you're showing my mind? Is that really what I'm supposed to grab? You know what, Lord? I'm just thinking that, you know, today's not a really good day, and I don't really like who I am today. And so, therefore, if you're showing me this, I'm really not grabbing a hold of it. Maybe you need to show it to me tomorrow after I had my cup of coffee. And God's saying, no, I'm showing it to you now. I'm saying, see And I'm going ahead of you. Now, are you going to follow me to where I'm going? So he says that the Ark of the Covenant went ahead, and the 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and the priests carried the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan. The priests with the Ark, with the Lord of all the earth, stepped in. Its waters were flowing downstream, And and it said that they will be cut off and they will be able to stand up in a heap. So the people broke camp to cross the Jordan. The priests carried the Ark of the Covenant, went ahead of them. and And the Jordan was at flood stage during the harvest. But as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing and piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah was completely cut off. So what happened? They stepped in. You see, faith with action produces something. See, we can talk a real good game. We say, I see God working over there, whatever. But until you step forward, you're not going to get another order from God. It's not coming. You're wondering why you don't hear him talking? Did you do the last thing he told you to do? It's that simple. It's that simple. If he says, I'm ahead of you, and, and you can actually see this thing, can you step? I'm already protecting you. I'm ahead of you. Can you just step? Oh, but no, Lord, I can't step. Mm-mm. No, God. See, you don't, you don't understand what they did to me, God. Lord, you don't understand what they did to me yesterday. Mm, God, you don't understand the rumors, God. You, you, Lord, you don't understand. They're talking behind my back and everything, God. No, no Lord, Lord, you don't really want this for me. You want it for, for them over there, but you don't want it for me. You've given God all your excuses, and you're right on the edge of your promise instead of just moving your feet to put it in the water, and then the miracle's going to happen. But you're spending so much time telling them what you can't do instead of saying, God, I see it, 
and I'm just going to believe it. I'm just going to go for it. And you know what? You know how sometimes, you know how little kids, when you're trying to tell them that they're doing something wrong, they put their hands over their ears and they go, I can't hear you. Just give the devil a little bit of that. Go, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I know that looks ridiculous, but you all look like that when nobody's watching. You just do. I've seen it before. You got your, ah, don't talk to me like that. That's what you need to give the devil a little bit of. Because he's telling you, don't humble yourself to follow the Lord. Don't humble yourself. Don't get down. Don't cross the Jordan. Don't do that. Because he's already trying to rob you of what's on the other side of it. He already sees what's on the other side of it. He sees because surely you told somebody, God said this to me. You didn't say you didn't believe it, but you did tell somebody what God said. The enemy heard it. And now the enemy says, I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this and I'm going to take it in the mind first. See, I'm going to shrink their soul to nothing and then they won't step. We have to get to a place where we say, you know what, God, I see the reality. I've prepared for it. I've prayed. I've fasted. I'm positioning myself to give. I hear your voice and I obey the word of God. I decree and I declare that I will only do the things that you say, Lord. And then in, in, with all faith, step into the water and let God do the rest. The word said when they stepped, everything stopped. But but it didn't stop until they stepped. You see, it's not going to happen for you until you step. And sometimes the first step is the hardest step. We know when babies are learning how to walk, the first step's the hardest step for them. It's the same thing for those of us that have been hurt, damaged, bruised, whatever it is that we believe has happened to us, that's just enough to cause us to say, I'm not going to step. But all God wants from you is a commitment that if you'll see the ark, you'll see the presence of God before you, and you have enough to believe that you'll step and you'll follow. So I have an exercise for you for the rest of the week. I want you in your quiet time with God, write down what you're afraid of. Write down what's keeping you from stepping. Something's keeping you from stepping. But because you're praying and fasting and seeking God, you're going to hear his voice this week. And you're going to hear it enough to have him say, you're not stepping because of this. And that's when you go and you hold up that thing to God and say, Lord, I nail that to the cross on Friday night. I bury that on Saturday morning and I raise without that thing. And I plan on stepping while I'm here on Sunday morning, all dressed up and ready to go because I'm crossing the Jordan. I'm stepping in and that thing was nailed on Friday night and it was dead and buried on Saturday. And then your new year starts, but not until then. Your new year does not start until Resurrection Sunday because now you're consecrating yourself for what's ahead of you. So God says to you tonight, I'm going to take you over. I'm going ahead of you. I'm putting the ark before you. Will you just believe what you see? And if you cannot believe what you see, will you at least give me enough time to tell you why so I can help you over to the other side? Come on, slap your neighbor and say, I'm so glad I'm stepping in on Sunday. All right, if it's your first time in this place tonight, God just getting you ready for the next thing that's getting ready to happen. You see, you're about ready to step over into relationship with Jesus Christ because you can't have a promise and a destiny unless you know the one who gives the promise and who is the destiny. It's real simple to know Jesus. All you have to do is say that you need him. 
number one. I need you. And then you just confess all the reasons why you're not sure he wants to be with you. It's really easy. Lord, I don't think you want to be with me because I did X, I did Y, and I did Z. But God, I want to know you and I need you. And Lord, will you come and will you live within my heart and make me holy and make me righteous so that I can live the way you want me to live, so that I can live in the promised land like you've promised me I can if I'll only believe. If that's you tonight, there'll be some people back in the Next Steps table. You can go back there and you can pray with them and they'll have a Bible for you. Or you can come up front. You can pray with us up front. We will walk you through that prayer. We will stand with you. Maybe you just need us to stand with you and hold your hand so that you can get through the next couple of days so you have the strength to step in on Sunday. Because we're going to step in on Sunday. That's right. Nobody's going to stop us. No one's stopping us from stepping in on Sunday. It's a, it's, a, it's a for sure thing. We're stepping in. We're crossing over on Sunday. So you can come on up at that time. We will pray with you. We'll pray with you for a healing or for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let's stand to our feet and worship the Lord in this place and give him honor as he prepares us for our next steps with him.